Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Abundant Living Ecuador podcast. I am Jesse Bayer, here as always with Darnell Dunn. We are the co-founders and managing partners of Abundant Living Ecuador. Um, our the quick business, uh, three weeks in a row remembering the business, website www.abecuador.com. That's A as in apple, B as in boy, ecuador.com. 800 number, 888-999-0948. Good from the U.S. and Canada. Um, we got a great show for you today. We had actually a last minute cancellation of a guest, which, uh, had us scrambling for, for material to prepare for this show, but you know, we've got a lot of it. So we've got a great show for you today. We're going to chat with you about the current developments, um, that we've been doing at the company and for our development and also get into, uh, a little bit in depth into some of the goings ons on the political front here in Ecuador and geopolitically as well. So some of the financial stuff in the U.S. and some of the geopolitical developments taking place here in the world. Um, coming from you again on a beautiful day here in Loja, Ecuador. Um, for those that don't know, we are a real estate and relocation services company based out of southern Ecuador, Loja, Ecuador. Uh, we focus on... Um, giving access to international clientele, everything that Southern Ecuador has to offer, both from an uh, expat relocation standpoint and an investment standpoint. And we are also involved in a large development that we came to Ecuador to, Ecuador to do. So without further ado, um, we recently um, have taken on several new properties um, and we figured we could chat with you a little bit about those properties and also give you a sense for our process for what it means to list a property because listing a property here in Ecuador is not the same as listing a property in the U.S. or other places. There's much more legwork, much more due diligence. There's a whole process that goes into it that allows you, the client, to look at a property that we're listing and have the information you need to be able to purchase it um, worry-free. Exactly. Um, yeah. And we've got um, three properties that we've signed recently, a couple that I think we've mentioned on previous podcasts here. Uh, the first one is a 3.25 acre property. I think that turns out to be about... Hector property. Hector property yeah. that turns out to be about eight acres or so. Um, two rivers running through the property, um, most almost completely flat, um, perfect for anyone who wants to be growing food. Uh, there's already it's already set up to grow bananas, coffee, oranges, tangerines, cauliflower, alfalfa, um, limes, you know, yuca. Yeah, limes, yuca as well too. Thank Several you. others as well. Yeah, plenty of things growing there. Um, lots of flat land, great for you know more cultivation, more building, or potentially um, raising livestock. Um, and we have that listed at three hundred and fifty thousand negotiable. That'll be um, we're sending out our photo and video crew there Monday. It's currently being cleaned, and that's part of our process as well too. I don't know if you want to go into more detail on that, Jesse. Um, but we'll have that on the website by the end, by this time next week, mo more than likely. So that's one. Um, should we go into the process now, or yeah, yeah? Why don't um, you know? So we rewinding history for folks so they can understand how we got to this point, why we do what we do. Um, we, we spent a year looking for property ourselves. Darnell was really uh, handling most of the due diligence on that. And what we came to find out is there's just a lot of moving parts that there aren't back home. So we've touched on this on previous episodes, but no title insurance in Ecuador. So if you buy something that has a problem with it in terms of ownership or in terms of its use are the you know restrictions on its use that responsibility falls on you you may buy something that you can't do anything with so in our process of researching land properties we realized well if we're going to launch a real estate company we need to be able to provide uh, the peace of mind that comes with 
researching all of these topics for our clients. Absolutely. I mean, one example comes to mind, not one that we experienced, but one that we heard about where someone purchased the property that had rivers running through the middle of the property. And what they weren't aware of is that the government makes people have an area of protection on either side of the river, 15 meters from the border, from, right? Uh, 30 from a river, right? 15 from 50 from a, from, a, from a stream and 30 from a river. So if you've got a, you know, a couple acre property and those streams run through the middle of the property, there's not a whole lot of usable land, but you're still paying for the land next to the river that you can't use. And so, you know, that was one in particular that really stuck out to me that can very easily happen if people just don't know the rules. And our whole goal with starting this company was to be able to give people, again, that peace of mind that you were talking about. Yeah, and streamline that process. And there's just a lot of those pitfalls. It's like you can buy – so that how does that process work, right? And, and I'll get to the pitfalls. But how does that process work? Um, you can get certificates from the various agencies that say if there's restrictions on your land or not. And that's something that we do. So if there's any property that has any possibility of having any type of restriction on it, we're going to research that at the applicable government agency, and we're going to get the certificate that says from the government, no, you're not on a forestal reserve. No, there's no restrictions as to your use of the land in terms of agriculture or anything else. And yes, you can build a road, and yes, you can do all the things you want to do, um, because those things work differently here. You have areas that are um, what's the word like not indicated like uh, oh, I forget the word but that you have areas that are designated designated thank you you have areas that are designated for X Y or Z um, and you may you could literally purchase a property and never know that until you start your project and six months later some government agent comes by and says hey what are you doing you're not allowed to you know do this here this is designated blah 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 and you know, you realize that your entire investment went down the drain. So when we take on a property, for example, this property in, in Rumishitana, which is, um, we mentioned this a week or two ago, but this property, which is halfway between uh, Malakatos and Loja, uh, it's, it's, it's a sweet property. It's, it's a property I would, I would very, very much enjoy to live on. But um, this property that has the two, it has two rivers and all these other things, you know, we, we went ahead and did a boundary study, so that's also part of every every listing we take on. The reason we do that is because you have discrepancies between the amount of land that's on title, on the title, and the amount of land that's actually there. So you could have a property where the owner says, hey, you know, I've got 50 hectares, but it's really 30. Um, so you think you're buying 50, you're buying 30. So we make sure that when we're dealing with our clients, we've done all of that due diligence in all of those ways. And so we are saying, well, yes, it says this on the title. It's actually this. Um, here's the restrictions or if there are any. And um, ideally, we're doing a topographical report as well if when applicable. And that comes about because titles in general here in Ecuador are relatively young. They're relatively recent phenomenon. And so when most titles are instituted, or at least the time when they were, they would just mark off different boundaries. For example, you know, you know, north the boundary is you know this rock. North it's the property of you know Julio Valdez. You know, on the right it's it's uh, this river, and on the left it's you know whatever. I a think tree. You, a tree. You get the point. And so whatever land is inside those boundaries is. So somebody would just say, well, hey, it's this much land and that goes on the title. Well, now they're using more sophisticated methods, mainly GPS. And so you can get exact, exact data in terms of how much area is within the boundaries that you're um, that you're that the title that you have for the land um, stipulates. And so that's why there can be a discrepancy and and, uh, and you can purchase the land not knowing that there's a discrepancy a lot m less land than you thought but you're paying the price um, a lot of times people in Ecuador will have a per meter or per square unit uh, of measurement price for the land and so if you're paying one price 
and you're getting much less than you thought you were, you know, much less than what you paid for, then, you know, that's, that's something that really impacts your investment or whatever it is that you're trying to do on the land. And so that's one of the things that, that uh, we'd really like to help uh, people who are looking to purchase property here in Ecuador avoid. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's the process. Um, oh, the other, why don't you touch on Madre Tierra? Sure. So I think we've also mentioned this as well, but um, we had taken on a beautiful hotel located in Vilcabamba, tour- touristic, as they say here, uh, area of Ecuador. It's one of the only parts of southern Ecuador outside of Cuenca and some areas on the coast that foreigners frequent. Um, a profitable hotel, really a sweet deal, actually, for, for an investor, especially somebody who's got some experience in hotel management or marketing. Um, I won't rehash that. We've talked about that before, but we had um, used the photos that the hotel had provided us previously when we listed it a couple of months back um, because it was dry season in Vilcabamba. And so uh, Southern Ecuador, as we've, as if you've, if you've uh, read our blogs and, and listened to us, you already are aware of, but Southern Ecuador has a rainy and a dry season. Now the rainy season is, we're not talking monsoon weather <laughs> at all. <laughs> rainy season means it rains a bit. Um, not not super rainy at all, but rainy enough, wet enough that the mountains are green. Dry season, it rains never. And so you've got like um, four or five months in that neighborhood where it doesn't rain and the mountains dry out. So when the mountains dry out, they're brown. Um, if you've ever been out to like, I think it's just north. I'm not from there, so this could be wrong. <laughs> but I think it's just north of the Bay Area. In California, there's a part of the year where the mountains are just really, really dry and brown. Although, currently with the <laughs> drought in California, drought in California, maybe they're brown year round. I don't know. Yeah. But um, but it's that kind of thing. So it, it, they dry out. So, anyways, we were waiting for the mountains to green up, which they've done. I wonder if they paint the mountains there when they get brown now. I know that's like a growing business in California now. Economic right. innovation, baby. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so the mountains are green now and we've gone in now to shoot the photos and videos of this hotel. So we'll have that coming online as well in the next couple of weeks. Okay. And the last property is a, um, a fully furnished condo on the fifth floor of a building within walking distance of downtown. Incredible views. Loja that is. Loja. Yep. Fully furnished. Three bedroom, two and a half bath. Um, Building um, is equipped with an elevator, uh, private storage, as well as a um, as a parking spot in in, in a parking garage uh, under the building. Um, great finishings, um, very high quality furniture as well too, and we have that uh, listed at 150. Uh, we should be getting that on the website also in the next couple of weeks. And the last property is um, we actually um, haven't got we don't have it scheduled to shoot yet that'll be probably over the next couple of weeks as well too uh but it was just such an incredible deal relative to what prices have been in vilcabamba recently that we just had to send it out on our mailing list and it's a property that's 1.28 acres um 500 excuse me 5213 square meter lot completely flat within 10 me- 10 minutes of in driving of Vilcabamba um a has a house on it two bedroom one bath house with a fireplace open floor plan 90% finished and we have it listed at 115,000 you know, as many of you know who are listening or have listened to us in the past, Vilcabamba is just one of the destinations that foreigners want to be in Ecuador and after a period of time of that being the case, you know, prices have risen pretty sharply there. And so um, it's just very difficult to get that size piece of land for that price and to be able to have a house that you can really work with and, and finish to your liking. Uh, pretty incredible deal. So we've gotten all the information out on our mailing list. If you haven't joined our mailing list, I encourage you to do so um, by just going to our website, www.abequador.com for more information yeah that's uh an incredible incredible deal uh, that house also is built to international standards built by a, a british gentleman and 
built to international standards. So you've got a international quality house on how many acres did you say? Uh, one point two. One point two acres for a buck fifteen uh, in some of the most sought after area right. of, of Ecuador. So yeah, and negotiable. The, negotiable. the owner is uh, certainly motivated to sell, um, and so he's open to receiving offers. So we're uh, in the process of feeling those now. If you're listening and have interest, definitely feel free to get in touch with us. We'd love to talk about it. So interesting uh, update on our project out at uh, this big piece of land, which we talked about in episode number nine. I encourage anybody out there, go check out episode number nine. That gives a rundown of this big development that we um, have planned here in Ecuador that we've purchased the land for and are in the planning stages of doing. Um, so we were putting together an investment packet for people who may be interested in uh, investing in some capacity in this project. And as part of that, um, I had the pleasure of taking our photographer uh, slash videographer out to the land uh, a few days ago, or actually what day was that? Yesterday. And uh, hiking up to the very top of the land, which is, which is a extremely uh, strenuous exercise, especially for somebody who has not been in the gym in nine months, <laughs> as I have not. Um, and we spent uh, the afternoon through the night or through the sunset um, up there filming and, and, and taking photos. We'll be back. Uh, I'll be back on the land with him next week to check out the other parts that we want photographed and, and videoed for a video and, and a website that we're going to put together that highlights the project and uh, we can use as a reference for people who are interested in, in being involved in it. Um, so a couple of interesting developments while I was out there. One, God, it was great to be back. I just uh, it feels so good being on that land. It's, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And watching, watching the sunset from the t peak of those mountains over the city of Loja. So basically you've got the entire valley of Loja in your view and then the sun sets on the opposing side, the opposite side of the valley. It is, uh, I mean, it is just spectacular. I was saying to our, our photographer while we were out there, I was like, you know, I was just commenting on, wow, Ecuador is just so incredibly beautiful. It's amazing how beautiful it is. And he's, he said his anecdote was, yeah, yeah, I was in the north of the country photogra photographing this volcano and I was there with a Canadian and he kept saying the same thing, but I don't know, I've been here my whole life, it doesn't really, <laughs> and I said, yeah, you know, I've been here a few years, it's, I'm, I'm even growing accustomed to it, but it, but it's still, uh, it's still just spectacular. Anyhow, um, so we were out there, we did that, we'll have that video and photos ready as well in the next couple of weeks, we've got a lot of, of, of different projects going on, and some interesting developments. They've um, we 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 were going to build a road up the backside of the development in order to gain access to the property. Not a particularly long or or costly road, um, and we had secured the rights to do so in the purchase. Um, and it turns out that the electric company came in and built this road about mm, seventy to eighty percent of the. Uh, length that we would have needed to reach our property. There was already an existing like footpath, so you just needed to expand it and um, pat it down. What do you call it? Um, uh, uh, make it hard, whatever that, that word is. Anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> make it <Whoa>. hard. Huh? <laughs> hey, that was you. You know, that's your mind, not mine. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, compact it. That's the word I was looking for. Compact it. So. Uh, the electrical electric company has come in. They've they've done that. They've constructed the road um, about three quarters of the way up that we were going to, but they've put in these high tension power lines on the other side of the mountain, not on our property, but on the other side of the mountain on the back side of the valley. And you know, for anybody who's watched Aaron Brockovich, <laughs> or or <laughs> not you know, I, okay, or, or hopefully you know done their own research, uh, knows that, you know, those are, those are damaging the health. So they've constructed this, these high tension power lines, again, not on our land, on the valley behind it, but they're going to run very high over the piece of land that we're currently trying to purchase to connect to that land. So we've got a, it's an interesting, uh, uh, cosmic signal, which we're trying to sort out as to what that means. We, we've had a good, a piece of our work done for us and also, sort of uh, damaged the 
likability or the, the, the value from our perspective of this other piece of land that we want to buy. Um, so that was interest, interesting news recently that happened this week. Um, but yeah, we should have that website ready to go in the next couple of weeks, um, and we'll certainly shoot that to you guys when we when we have it, um, describing more in detail the entire plan of the development, and and uh, looking for looking for partners in that endeavor. Great. So next up, do we want to touch on some current events here in Ecuador? Or? Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, something that was kind of interesting and, and I think, um, you know, ties into a conversation we were having off air just about all the things that are going on in the world. Um, one thing that's happened here recently is, um, and I'll actually read this to you, it was um, came out in The Guardian yesterday. And the title of the article is Protest in Ecuador as Lawmakers Approve Unlimited Presidential Terms. And before, before you get into this, let me just... Um Give two seconds of, of context. So there's there's been this ongoing political situation and sort of fight in Ecuador surrounding what President Correa can and cannot get away with. Um, and so they passed they passed all these uh, the the quote legislator and the legislator is kind of the lapdog of Correa and well the article I think gets into that if I'm not mistaken but they passed all of these uh, measures yesterday um, in the in the legislature or the day before whenever it was. And within the last two days, and um, and um, this this article which Darnell sent me, and he's about to share with you, uh, it, it it nails it, I think, in terms of kind of what what uh, some of the ramifications of that are. And by the way, just to for people who've been listening to the show, um, none of the measures surrounding uh, that we've talked about in the past surrounding uh, capital gains or um, Herencia, what is uh, in English? Uh, estate taxes estate, uh, yeah, or uh, inheritance, inheritance taxes. Inheritance, right. thank you. <laughs> uh, inheritance taxes are, are, those are still not on the docket and not expected to be. I still feel like the political tides have turned in those ways. But um, so just to give, to give a little bit. And I think the next couple of weeks here will be telling in that way. You know, it's hard to say the other variable is the fact that it's the hol- we're getting into the holiday season and people here don't really do anything during the holiday season. <laughs> Just as a quick anecdote to that, the uh, municipality of Loja is now closed for the year as of December fourth. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> if that doesn't if that doesn't uh, illustrate the point, I don't know what does. Um, so I'll get started here. So, Ecuador's National Assembly voted on Thursday to pass a constitutional amendment abolishing presidential terms from 2021 onwards. A few blocks from the building, police clashed with demonstrators who see it as an attempt by President Rafael Correa to tighten his grip on power. Correa, who has been the president since 2007, has said that he will sit out the next election when his term finishes in 2017. Analysts sit see the move as a way of sidestepping rising discontent after his government responded to an economic slump by imposing new taxes and slashing public spending. They're referring to the the budget of 2016 that's cutting government spending by 16%. Yes. (laughs) Protesters wielding sticks battled with riot police and burned tires in the capital, Quito, in hours surrounding the vote. Demonstrations against the against the amendments also took place in Guayaquil and Cuenca. A package of 16 constitutional amendments was voted through on a margin of 100 to 8 vote in the 137 seat National Assembly in which Correa's Alianza País party has a two-thirds majority. Several opposition politicians boycotted the vote. Right, and it's like, this is just a great example, right? I mean, 100 to 8 was this vote, and Darnell's going to get into what it was in a second, but it's very controversial. It's very disliked by the populace in Ecuador. I mean, very, very, very unpopular. And it was voted on by a margin of 100 to 8 in favor. And that it just really goes to illustrate um, the lapdog nature of the current uh, assembly. Right. And I think it also flies in the face of what is what is being communicated about Ecuador outside of Ecuador, which is that 
the president is this is the most popular figure in South America and you know he's you know Superman and he does this and he does that and oh you know oh things aren't going well but you know people still approve him but you know they're rioting in the streets yeah so. no it's total nonsense it's amazing how that how uh, successful they've been internationally even as you're as you're saying in uh, in um, getting that storyline uh, sort of uh, out there right. and, and as the kind of leading storyline in terms of what's going on you right. know, we have this populist uh, popular president who's opposed by these corporations and conservatives and you know business and interests and banks and you know he's very persecuted and you know the people yeah. are are supporting him I mean, it's just it's that's bullshit I mean that's yeah. just complete and total utter yeah. nonsense yeah. Uh, the guy is so popular that he spent 4.7 million dollars uh, of government money on uh, a public relations campaign yeah and, and he's, he's so popular he has to you know gag the press and you know put 20 bazillion police out there to make sure that you know people are in line when he passes all his new proposals and on and on. Oh, well, we're going to get into that. <laughs> that um, yeah, and we'll touch on that. Now, when I get to that, I'll stop because this is maybe a two-page article and I don't want to take too much time here, but I did feel that it needed to be read here. Quote, we will continue governing for the common good with total d democratic legitimacy, Correa tweeted from Europe, where he was attending the <laughs> Paris Conference on Climate Change. But he, luckily he wasn't on camera. He didn't have to say that with a straight face, which would have been impossible. Right. And of course, you know, he's in Europe while, these, while 16 constitutional amendments are being passed. <laughs> <laughs> By his legislature. Not, not not put to vote, not put to popular vote as the Constitution dictates. Oh, but, yeah. well, hear the... Hear the <laughs> I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I got to calm down. <laughs> like, you're just throwing me all these softballs, which is just great. <laughs> Quote, they, the opposition, want us to get back to the old country dominated by the, usurp the usurp usurpation? No, you... Yeah. Yeah, usurpation. Wow, I'm, my English reading is getting really it's bad. It's amazing how that happens when you speak Spanish all the time. Your English, like, you literally take steps backwards. In right. Of popular represent... <laughs> the usurpation of popular representation immobilize us, impede us from governing. We will make mistakes, but in Ecuador, the Ecuadorian people are in charge. And here's the best part, and I'll close with this. The opposition congressman, Luis Fernando Torres, called the vote a, quote, constitutional fraud as it, was a, as it approved reforms without a referendum. Opinion polls indicate 80% of Ecuadorians wanted the amendments to be put to a national vote, but the constitutional court ruled it unnecessary. I, mean, I think they needed to put constitutional court in, in quotes there. <laughs> well, they should have, but yeah. they didn't. So imagine... He said, we will make mistakes, but in Ecuador, the Ecuadorian people are in charge unless 80% want something to be one way and then they don't do it, but they're in charge. Yeah, I mean, it's Orwellian doublespeak at its finest. And so I think what I really wanted to, to touch on with this article, uh, and this was the conversation I was alluding to when I you know st first started reading it, Jesse, that we were having off air is just that... You just can't beat them at their own game. You know, they've got they've got this <laughs> they got a pretty good plan and, and a pretty good team to implement it. And so a lot of these conventional ways, I mean, we can talk to her blue in the face about things that are going on in the world, things that we don't like, things that don't make any sense, things that really take away people's freedom of expression and, and freedom of action. Um, but in the end, the solution is just to find an alternative. And that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about this land project. It's really what we came here to do. And we feel that, um, that we've got the opportunity to, um, to put that into action. Yeah. That is unfortunately accurate. Um, yeah, and part of this package of uh, reforms, <laughs> to get back to the Orwellian doublespeak, part of this package of reforms that they've just approved um, They've taken greater control over the media, and they've got gone done away with term limits. So, 
I mean, the article mentioned that, you mentioned that, but so just to recap for people. So Correa can now continue to run uh, ad infinitum, and he also now has control over the press. They had already um, had a law in the books. They already have a law in the books that um, curtails to a great degree freedom of the press, but they've now taken that a step further. They have uh, categorized the press currently now as a public service as a public service right so that gives them governing authority um over the press in a more above board way than they already had which they already had a pretty pretty great deal of so overt a, i think overt maybe. thank you yeah um continuing on this line and you know as Darnell said, you know, to a certain degree, this stuff doesn't interest us that much, really. Um, you know, this stuff's going on all over the world. You've got every government on the planet implementing greater control mechanisms, um, usurping, quote, democracy, which I'm not in favor of anyway, but usurping, you know, the power of the people, I guess you could maybe say, although I'm not using that as a socialist slogan. <laughs> um, Man, we've got power of the people. Unity. Um, we've got a... Uh, We've got a Aaron Brockovich reference, <laughs> making it hard. What's going on, man? Uh, yeah, jeez, jeez, <laughs> you got me there. Um, so you know these things are happening all over the world. We can, as Darnell was saying a second ago, it's like we can document them till we're blue in the face, as lots of people all over the world are doing. That doesn't change anybody's opinion. So you know we're just we we hit on some of these things because we think that they are relevant to your decisions as to hey, am I going to go to Ecuador and live? Am I going to go to Ecuador and start a business? Um, which in the end, our analysis of the situation is those are great options. That being said, there's stuff going on here you should be aware of. And so we, we bring it up for that reason. Absolutely. Um, so this next article is from Pan Am Post. The title of the article is Correa's Constitutional Reforms Are the End of Ecuadorian Democracy. And again, just to jump back on that, uh, I'll get on my soapbox for five seconds. Um, you know, democracy means me and Darnell, there's three people, me and Darnell and you, and me and Darnell vote that we would like to kill you. And we vote and we win and we kill you. Yeah. That's democracy. Um, so, so this whole... Passed on a two-to-one margin. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Or, you know, or to tax you or to take your land or to, you know, take your labor or enslave you or whatever else we decide to do. So this, I, this kind of idea that majority collectivism, which democracy is, collectivism and majority rule is somehow a good thing, I disagree with. But that being said... It's better than dictatorship, so you know there's uh, there's, mar there's 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 levels to this. <laughs> there's levels of yeah, exactly. So, anyways, Pan Am Post, Correa's constitutional reforms are the end of Ecuadorian democracy, and I'll just skip around a little bit in this article. Um, so, this opinion states: what we have is an autocracy where the national assembly. Democrat National Assembly simulates democratic procedures while rubber stamping any legislation sent by President Correa, who believes he is not accountable to anyone. As a result, Ecuadorians are no longer asked to approve constitutional reforms at the voting booth. We just talked about that. Absurdly, the 2008 Constitution required a referendum to be approved, but current amendments made in the National Assembly do not need the Ecuadorian people's consent. The 16, And this is, again, talking about these same... Um, amendments that were just uh, passed. The 16 amendments in question are ornamental, semantic distortions meant to disguise the underlying issue. They will allow Correa to re-elect himself indefinitely. They, they legitimize his wish to perpetuate himself in power. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I largely agree with that. Um, again, I don't know that the people are going to go for that. I mean, I think really what, if anything, what th they're setting up politically is some major uh, fights in the future because this is not a popular president, despite um, fake opinion polls. Um, so, people or opinion polls generated by electronic voting machines. Right. Well, that's another issue, right? Is that they've got electronic voting machines now here in Ecuador, so Correa can run and say he won, and you know, there's no paper trail to say he didn't. You know, and going back to the point that you were making about people knowing, you know, what's going on here to make an informed decision about coming here. It, it's kind of interesting that that um, people sort of look at, or at least people that I've spoken to, um, people that have, have expressed interest in coming here and just people that I know from home who, are, who, you know, who I just keep in touch with who aren't coming to Ecuador. It's like people... 
keep in mind, you know, this is going on in Ecuador. But, you know, name one thing that, or name one law that Barack Obama has passed in the last six months that wasn't just done by executive order. I mean, is that going through yeah. the judiciary or is that going through the Congress, which is, you know, which are supposed to be, quote unquote, checks and balances? No. A, or, a lot of Bush before him. I mean, it's right. the same thing always, right? I mean, and, and, and not only that, I mean, it's not just laws. It's just like administrative rulings. It's right. like, well, we decided you can no longer do this. Or we decided, you know, this has this is going to be this way because Congress voted to create this agency that oversees x right and you know all along you know you're just your freedoms get diminished right and so it's just it's something that you know in a country that you know people would say oh you know well in ecuador you know they're doing this this and that and it would be people who are in the united states who are you know by insinuation stating that that's not happening in the united states and really what's happening here is not unique to here it's happening all over the world. The governments all over the world are instituting, instituting these kinds of measures, no matter what kind of form of government they say they have on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, well said. Very well said. Um, next article I wanted to bring to your attention is... Uh, it hurts me. This article hurts me to read. <laughs> um, it's, it's a phenomenal illustration of the shortcomings of the idea that a overarching power will decide the fate of people for them. Um, and that's, you know, what government is. Uh, so in the, this is from the International Business Times, a publication out of the UK. Uh, the title of the article is Ecuador's Silicon Valley. Quito, Quito bets big to be South America's next high-tech powerhouse. And I'll run through pieces of this article, um, but I just want to give you a uh, brief summary before I do. So basically what, Equ what Correa's administration has done is they um, created this city in the north uh, a couple, two, three hours outside of Quito um, that you know was going to be the next uh, Silicon Valley, which is, which is hilarious if you think about it because... The idea of a country that has zero, zero electronics uh, infrastructure taking the place of, say, you know, Korea uh, or, or, you know, any other or, you know, Malaysia or I don't even know. I know I'm, I'm not up on this anymore, but, you know, wherever they're making electronics these days, even Silicon Valley in the States, that's just funny. They would they would need um, government quote support <laughs> uh f for the next 300 years to government support with the money that they gave the or the government took from them to then support right what <laughs> <laughs> huh <laughs> yeah so anyhow um let me get to this article so yakai and i may be pronouncing that i think it's poorly. yachai yachai okay yachai ecuador uh fernando albericio wanted to make history Lured by the opportunity to help jumpstart a tech revolution in a new country, Albericio, a veteran professor of organic chemistry with a passion for developing science and higher education centers across Latin America, packed up his home in Spain, put his family on a plane, and moved into a new house in Ecuador in May 2014. His new career found him overseeing Yachay Tech, Ecuador's first full-fledged research university, specializing in technical fields like nanotechnology and petrochemistry, and staffed with world-class faculty, something akin to a Massachusetts Institute of Technology for the Andes. It was a centerpiece for what President Rafael Correa called, quote, the most important project in the history of Ecuador. A, a brand new city that would catapult the small, often overlooked nation into a new role as South America's next powerhouse of technology and innovation. Mind you, this is a this is a country that farms. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, citizens' revolution, citizens, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but within a year of Alber Albericio's move, frustration had set in. Ecuador was plunged into an economic crisis, and Albericio was regularly clashing with three other members of the university's board of trustees over what he said was mismanaged funds. Again, shocker, shocker. <laughs> the government project that is using stolen money with no profit motive is mismanaging funds? I cannot believe it. 
Um, I'm shocked and appalled, Jesse. Shocked and appalled. Students were taught in classrooms, outfitted with chairs and desks left over from a rundown local high school. Research laboratories didn't have gas or ventilation systems installed. In July, Albericio was voted... This is the world-class... World-class. This is MIT. (laughs) Albericio was voted out of his post, and a handful of teachers and administration staff, disillusioned with the entire project, resigned in protest. Yes, there's good people in the world. So this quote, the students there, the students there are the best in the country, he said. This is Albericio. The students there are the best con- in the country, he said. They all want to be in nanotechnology, but they will find after two, three, four years that there is nothing for them here. And this was all a big lie. Uh, moving on. They're talking about um, the plan and what, what they were trying to do. If the plan works, Yachai will help incubate a generation of top-tier top tier science and engineering talent that will discover medical cures, develop astounding new technologies, and attract the world's top companies, making Ecuador the envy of its neighbors. But that's a tall order for a city being built entirely from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, Jesus, wow. the balls of these people. I mean, that might be the understatement of the century. Right. And with, and with plummeting revenues and controversies already brewing over funding and construction plans, it's far from certain the proposed miracle in the Andes can survive the steep uphill climb ahead. Um, I like what they did there. Steep uphill climb, Andes. <laughs> Andes right. um, uh, let's see. Ecuador's economy has long been wanting for a transformation. Its output and gross domestic product per capita have often ranked in the bottom half of South American uh, nations alongside neighbors like Peru or Paraguay, rather than regional giants like Brazil or Chile. Brazil is collapsing, by the way. (laughs) No, that's an overstatement. Um, Correa's tenure as president, which began in 2007, brought along with its steep reduction in poverty and a wealth of new infrastructure. The economy remains deeply dependent on exports of raw goods like crude oil, bananas, and shrimp. The need to advance beyond Ecuador's dependencies on raw goods became painfully acute over the last year as falling global crude oil prices gouged a $7 billion hole in next year's government budget. Again, would anybody disagree with that analysis? Absolutely not. But how do you um, reach those goals? Through a centrally planned economy or through reactions in the marketplace? Um, Correa kicked off plans to build Yachai in 2012 with a vision of creating a, quote, knowledge economy. That could innovate, that could add innovative products to the economic mix. As soon as the plans for Yachai became public, questions abounded over how the remote city would live up to its promises and attract the best minds Ecuador had to offer. Yachai, currently made up mostly of vacant pasture land, is a two-hour drive through twisting mountains, twisting mountain roads from the capital Quito, the nearest major city and location of the closest airport. The closest municipal municipalities, Orcuri and Ibarra are quiet towns that have much less to offer in nightlife and culture than Ecuador's largest cities. Skipping a whole bunch. Yeah. Um, Very interesting that they chose to build this, this um, what do they call it? An innovation city or a knowledge? Uh, they've got a slogan. <laughs> I mean, <right? laughs> some kind of buzzword. Yeah. You know, Let's cr- Silicon let- Valley. In, uh, in, in the, yeah, in the, the Silicon Valley of the Andes in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, this is central planning. Um, so moving on uh, in the same article, um, some, well, you know what, I'll skip that. That was just a critique saying that, uh, you know, this money could have been much better spent investing in current universities as opposed to trying to create a whole city. Um, okay, moving on. But much of the excitement over Yachai began before Ecuador's finances began careening into a tailspin. The global price of crude oil, which Ecuador depends on for about half of its export revenue, plummeted by nearly two-thirds since January 2014, putting many of Korea's big-ticket agenda items at risk, financially and politically. As public revenues began to drain, mass protests against him boiled during the summer for what critics said were unsustainable economic policies. It's unclear if Yachai, with a $1 billion price tag for its first five years of development, will survive past the tide of slumping oil prices or the end of Korea's presidency in 2017. Right, so there's a million bucks down the tubes. Um, billion. Billion, excuse With a me. B. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So moving on, but the recent departure of Albertio, the former head of Yachay Tech, opened up new scrutiny of the project's finances. As he split with the university in July, he voiced many of the complaints to local news outlets. This set off a wave of backlash that halted a number of donations to Yachay Tech, city officials said. One of Albericio's grievances was that four members of the board of trustees, which included himself, during his tenure earned a salary of $16,000 per month. If you put that in U.S. terms, that's something like 16, 30, 40, that's something like 60 grand a month, uh, supplied by taxpayers. The other three members were professor, professors at the California Institute of Technology, cousins of Korea, I'm sure, who didn't live in Ecuador and dedicated only part of their time through Skype and occasional visits to making decisions for Yachai Tech. So, right. Mm -hmm. uh, making almost $17,000 from Yachai without being there, without working, Albericio said, if it was a private company, they could pay whatever they want, but Ecuador is not a rich company. That's right. And if it was a private company, they wouldn't pay that amount because they'd have profit motive. <laughs> well, if they were a private company, they'd be broke. <laughs> <laughs> yes. right. They'd be in bankruptcy right now. After Albericio's departure, Larson, the school's chancellor, and Rodriguez, Yachai's Yachai EP's CEO joined the board of trustees, earning the same monthly salaries. <laughs> uh, well, Ericio, at least they were there. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Uh, Ericio questioned the board's other decisions, including spending $1 million on international scholarships for a joint master's program with Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, when he noticed Yachai Tech's own laboratories still didn't have gas or ventilation <laughs> systems installed. <laughs> Students didn't have an on-campus housing to didn't have on-campus housing to live in, and had to trek into Yachai for classes from a nearby town from the nearby town of Ibarra, about 11 miles away. Construction has stopped, he said. They cannot pay the workers, they cannot pay the companies, and students are sitting in miserable furniture. And the administration is spending money on stupid things: first-class airplane tickets. Albericio's. Well, I mean, the board members are making 16 grand a month. A month in Ecuador. I mean, you can't imagine the kind of money that is in Ecuador. Right. And they don't have, they're starting an innovation university, and they don't have the tools to, they don't have ventilation in the, uh, the, in the laboratories. Labs, yeah. <laughs> Government, I mean, you know, at its finest. Uh, the students feel like they're... For the most pro important project in the history of Ecuador, by the way. Which Korea touts to this day, which is, yeah, I mean, talk about propaganda. Um, Albericio, Albericio's departure was a major setback for morale at the university. One former Yachai Tech employee who was asked not to use her name for fear of reprisal said several students had become disillusioned with the school over Albericio's dismissal and conditions of the classrooms. Quote, the students feel like they're nothing for the university, she said, but they're everything for the university. If they don't have the students, what are they going to do? Put more money into it. <laughs> Rodriguez. <laughs> or take more money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Rodriguez, Yacha EPC, you know, I'm sure everybody made a lot of money on the government contracts to build the school and, you know, to put in yeah. roads and infrastructure and, right. you know, all, all the other ways that, you know, these yeah. things work. And I wonder how many of those companies were back, you know, were owned by cousins, brothers, nephews, uncles, aunts of those in power. Yeah. Right. Rodriguez, Yacha EP's, EP's CEO, dismissed Albericio's complaint, saying the former university head had authorized much of that spending as a member of the Board of Trustees. Quote, sadly, there was no leadership on the part of Albericio to self-critically take on what he was mistaken about, which he should have taken on what he was mistaken about. Wow. Uh, <laughs> he, said, he said, adding that there would very probably be legal proceedings against Albericio for the damage his criticisms had caused to the university's reputation. Uh, moving on. But, yeah, Alber right. uh, but, but he didn't say that any of the things that he said were not true. Yeah, well, they're not true, but he should have addressed them. <laughs> uh, Got it. But Albericio was blunt about his forecast for the city. Quote, and mind you, this is the guy who, you know, moved his family from Spain to, to be part of this project. This is, this is not, you know, an anarchist talking. <laughs> it will be a big fiasco, he said, citing Ecuador's economic squeeze. The city, they say, will bring in 13 research institutes, but it's impossible. They don't have the money for that. <laughs> um, oh, man, this article keeps going on. I got to get to this last part. So basically what they did was they used eminent domain, what we would call eminent domain, to kick out everybody that lived there while they were going to create this government orchestrated city. So meanwhile, in pockets around Yachai, a different kind of community resentment has already 
been brewing. When the Ecuadorian government conceived of the city, it carved out territory from the municipality of Ord Ord Ordkuki, <laughs> expropriating property from estate owners and evicting farmers who worked the land. Yachai EP officials, and this is always the playbook of the government here, Yachai EP officials said the vast majority of those displaced were wealthy landowners and, and, and that the company had provided jobs and educational opportunities for the nearby communities in Ordkuki. Did they also include, uh, what do they call that with a free trade agreement? The um, worker retraining? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. right. Oh, that uh, brings me back to my nonprofit days in New York. <laughs> but no, I don't know. Maybe they did. <laughs> uh, Yolanda Morillo, 63, has a different story. She had been a resident of the area now known as Yachai, where her, she where she, her husband, had owned around 24 acres of land, raising animals and cultivating carrots, corn, peppers, and a range of other fruits and vegetables. A clean, good life, sounds like to me. Sitting in her dim, cramped apartment in Yurt Kuki, she recounted how government officials abruptly handed out citations to her and her neighbors back in 2011, ordering them to leave their homes within three months without paying any compensation. She refused to leave without proper payment and eventually found a lawyer who helped litigate for excuse me, litigate for compensation totaling about half the value of her land. In April, she and her husband finally left, leaving the property and all their animals behind. The most severe, quote, the most severe, severe thing was the emotional psychological crisis, she said. It was like Russian roulette. Many of the people forced off the land were farmers and employees of the estates, she said, and the government's promises of jobs and education never materialized for them. There are no jobs here, she said. People look for jobs, but there aren't any. As for furniture and as for f her future in or I can't get the name or or cookie or cookie, <laughs> she said simply that it was quote uncertain. For the Morillo fa family and for Ecuador, the price of the dream of Yachai has in many ways already been paid. The stretch of land where Yolanda and her husband thought they would spend the rest of their lives now lies near the entrance of a shiny new building for a technical college, making up part of the city's sprawling academic complex. Just down the road is the university, where Correa visited in August, assuring teachers and students that the promise of a high-tech city was still within reach. Quote, Yachai is already transforming Ecuador. It's already on the global map, the president declared. Nobody will touch our Yachai. <laughs> <laughs> the global map of what? No, the other thing, too, is, you know, what happened to the poor woman's livestock? Did they take that, too? They're in safe. They're in custody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that article is just—it's so—it's so revealing and so painful on so many levels. So, there you have it. City of innovation. <laughs> I think you can call that public sector innovation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's like. That is the public sector innovation that Correa was touting uh, recently in a hilarious interview that you, you recounted to me. <laughs> if you haven't, if you if you weren't tuned into that podcast, Darnell had seen a or I, Darnell had seen a um, interview of Correa in was it CNBC that was doing the interview? Yeah, I think it was that a different one. That might have been a different one. I don't recall. So some uh, international inter public international uh, media outlet was doing an interview, and Correa made the statement which approximately translates to you know i don't know about the private sector but in the public sector we're innovating which you know i mean best case scenario the private sector is not innovating that's not good for your country regardless of what the public sector is doing but if you're going to then turn around and say well we're innovating by doing things like destroying lives and stealing money with our project of, you know, Yachai, which is supposed to be literally, I mean, his quote, his words came out of his mouth, the most important project in the history of Ecuador. <laughs> you know, what is that? I think that that tells you all you need to know. Yeah, I agree. And again, I mean, you know, we highlight Ecuador. If, if we were in the U.S., we'd be talking about the same thing yeah. um, or anywhere else. You know, we highlight Ecuador's stuff because we're here and we want to make you aware of what's going on here. And we're giving our opinion as well, obviously. But, um, you know, they're doing all of this stuff and worse in, in, in the states and everywhere else. It's it's kind of, a, you know, we're up against a global tyranny here um, in terms of in terms of control. And, and that's kind of what we're in part, at least what we're alluding to. 
Any other comments, questions, concerns? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, I guess we'll turn. We have a lot of a lot of material here. It's been a, we we uh, last week we, or last couple of weeks. I guess we were uh, focused on other things for the podcast, interviewing an attorney. If you haven't checked that out, last week and the week before, talking about our development. Yeah, we didn't even get to so, the China stuff. I had a lot of stuff on China I wanted China. to cover, but we can save that for next yeah, week. Yeah, let's uh no, go ahead. Let's um let's jump in. Let's jump into some of the international stuff that's going on. We've got uh we've got plenty of time. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, f- first thing that was very interesting, I and I don't know which podcast that was on that we we've talked about it a couple of times. Okay. Cover times. A couple of times with China and the and the uh and the, and the special drawing rights exactly. and the, the transfer of uh what's going to be the world's reserve currency and back trade and so forth. Exactly. So um, as of this week, and I don't recall exactly what day it was, um, the IMF approved China's application to be included in the special drawing rights basket. Um, And there was an article that I had that had the breakdown, but um, China is going to have something like the second largest... um, second or maybe third largest out of five in the basket uh, in terms of an allocation of special drawing rights. So pretty interesting stuff happened uh, much more quickly than I expected. Um, but it is going to have very large implications. And, you know, it was bound to happen. You know, China's in the top five in terms of um, trade denominated in their currency. Um, they're very active here and in a lot of emerging and frontier markets all over the world. Um, so it was bound to happen. Just, you know, surprised me that it happened so soon. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, you know, part another um, chink in the armor for the dollar and just part of the ongoing changing of the guard from the U.S. dollar being the dominant world currency and to, uh, at, at the very least, a basket and more likely the yuan. You know, another interesting thing from an article that came out from um, The Economist, actually today, it's titled, The Yuan Joins the SDR Maiden Voyage. And something that a lot of people hadn't anticipated, myself included, is just that special drawing rights would be used for anything anytime soon. And uh, actually, now in the Suez Canal, transit fees for crossing the Suez Canal are now de- denominated in special drawing rights. So not only is that going to increase the demand for yuan uh, as it becomes a more, um, as it moves towards a free-floating currency, but also it's going to increase the demand for special drawing rights and could potentially be a signal that special drawing rights will be used as a, as a currency. Yeah, I mean, just to recap for people, so special drawing rights are an electronic currency. They don't exist in physical form in any capacity, and they're only currently used um, as lending instruments, essentially, to governments. So if you're, you know, a government and you'd like to borrow money, you can theoretically dip into special drawing rights, and you're at interest, and you're, you know, somehow, and you're, and that's, that's theoretically how you're borrowing money, or how you're being allocated uh, money in by by places like the IMF, by international organizations such as the IMF. Now, is that governments who have control of that or central banks? My understanding, and I didn't research this in depth uh, to prepare for this at all. This is just going off I've come across in the past. My understanding is that special drawing rights are only used by governments but again they're borrowed into existence at interest from these international organizations that are of course funded and controlled by the world central banks um so that's how i would i would answer that um understood a um, couple more things on the international front um or maybe even jumping into stuff that's going on in the U.S. as well, um, and I'll run through these really fast. So the U.S. has hiked the fee to renounce citizenship by 422%. And I don't want to read you this article. Let me just give you, this is from Forbes. Let me just give you the numbers. The State Department 
interim rule has just raised the fee for renunciation of U.S. citizenship to $2,350 from $450. Critics note that it's more than 20 times the average level in other high-income countries. The State Department says it's about demand on their services and all the extra workload they have to process people who are on the way out. Perhaps, perhaps more accurately... They're making it more expensive for the rats to jump ship. <laughs> <laughs> um, another another article from Forbes. Passports required for domestic travel in 2016, but IRS can revoke passport for taxes. So basically this only applies to like three or four states. Uh, it's like New York, Minnesota, and one or two others. Um, but the IRS now can revoke your passport for taxes, for tax reasons, and... Even for domestic travel from certain states, you need a passport to travel. Even within the United States? Yeah, for, from certain states. Basically, what they did was they um, made new parameters as to what each state's ID uh, requirements for what each state for requirements that each state's ID had to meet for airline travel. And certain states... ID does not meet those requirements, and therefore you need a passport. Mm. But uh, like I said, I think it's four or five states. That's New York, Minnesota, and a couple of others. Okay. Yeah. Of course, you know these are always yeah incremental. They're just, right. It's just the uh, the tip of the iceberg. Um, interesting article outlining a recent uh, publication, uh, probably a newsletter that. Bill Gates put out, or Bill Gates, <laughs> Bill Gross put out. Bill Gross, for those that don't know, is considered like the Bond King. Is he still at Pimco, or did they split? I think no, they they, split, they right? split. They yeah. split last year. Now he's at Janus. Okay, yeah, yeah, and he's running a fund now. He had a big falling out with all of the uh, all the higher Pimco. ups at Pimco, yeah, yeah. including Elarian. Elarian, who's running it now? Uh, Elarian left. Oh, Elarian's um. Shoot, I forget what he's doing now, but he's no longer at Pimco. He had okay. he ended up leaving, and this didn't come out until after the fact. He ended up leaving for a split with Gross uh, because you know he was he was kind of being groomed to be to right. take over for Gross, right. and it sort of seemed, at least the way they portrayed it in the media, as you know, Gross's ego was just kind of too big for for everybody in the room, and they just couldn't deal with the guy anymore. And so Elarian left to go do his own thing. I think he's at. I think he's working at at um, Allianz, which is the oh, yeah, um, yeah. which is the parent company of Pimco. So they kind of moved him into a, another role where he didn't have to deal with Gross. And then eventually, you know, those same issues that El Arian was having with uh, Gross ended up, you know, the other portfolio managers who were responsible for running his fund, which was you know the biggest fund in the world at the time. Um, you know, they ended up forcing them out, basically, or something like something along those lines. Yeah. But, you know, anyhow, a guy, a guy who, who spent, you know, a bazillion years considered the Bond King, somebody whose uh, word is highly regarded on the street and in, in investment communities and forecasting communities. Um, artic- title of the article, How Does It All Play Out? Bill Gross explains how the Central Casino Bank's Martingale strategy ends. And I'll just highlight a very brief piece of this article. And again, this is... Um, a newsletter let me double check it is a yeah from bill gross's latest monthly investment outlook so yes his newsletter um that he puts out more breaking news this time on the investment side central banks are casinos they print money as if they were manufacturing endless numbers of chips that they'll never have to redeem actually a casino is an apt description for today's global monetary policy There is a well-known, quote, foolproof system in gambling circles that is sophisticatedly called the Martingale. And just uh, the Martingale, what that means is it's the idea that if you have an unlimited supply of money and you're at a casino, you can always double down and eventually you'll win. Um, So it's the idea of doubling down ad infinitum until you win a hand and then you, I guess you walk away, I guess probably would be. How that works, but it's the idea of doubling down uh, on your on your bet after losing, and as long as you have enough reserves to keep doubling down, you're okay. That's the Martingale strategy. So he says, how does this all play out? Timing is the key because, as gamblers know, there isn't an endless stream of Martingale chips, even for central bankers acting in unison. 
One day, the negative feedback loop on the real economy will halt the ascent of stock and bond prices, and investors will look around. Great analogy here. Investors will look around like Wiley E. Coyote, wondering how far is down. <laughs> <laughs> But when? When does Martingale meet its inevitable fate? I really don't know. I'm just certain it will. Doesn't help you much, does it? Except to argue that much like that much like time is relative to the speed of light, the faster and faster central bankers press the monetary button, <clears throat> the greater and greater the relative risk of owning financial assets. I would gradually de-risk portfolios as we move into 2016. Less credit risk, reduced equity exposure, placing more emphasis on the return of your money than a double-digit return on your money. Even Martingale casinos eventually fail. They may not run out of chips, but like Atlantic City, the gamblers eventually go home and their doors close. So he 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 talks more in this article about uh, central bank policy, basically of printing um, and and you know monetary uh, easing, uh, low interest rates, and how that cannot go on forever, and you know eventually that ends in collapse. Right. Well, he would know very well because he's one of those insiders that that article talks about that gets that information so he's sanctioned to give it absolutely you know jumping off of that or piggybacking off of that quickly another article is by zero hedge quote academic study shows fed engaged in systematic leaks to insiders and you know i'll read a very small portion of that but it's just you know yeah like the game's rigged folks um So, you know, make your own way. Uh, but if you're going to play in a rigged game, you know, you could end up on the good side or the bad side, I suppose, of, of how that game is rigged. But um, very likely the parameters that you're making your decisions based off of are not accurate. Because the analysis, unless the analysis is of the way the game is rigged, which... It's very hard to find analysis like that. The analysis will, is inaccurate. When we're talking about markets, stock markets, and and, and the like. Um, anyhow, pattern of Fed leaks and market gains established. Quote: It is from a a study. Uh, quote: The Fed uses informal communication channels on even number weeks after FOMC meetings. Uh, Fed insider trading investigation is the tip of a regular system of leaks where little concern for being prosecuted exists, the report claims. And it goes on, but so the Fed is leaking information to insiders as many people have speculated for many years. Let me guess, um, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. <laughs> right, the five biggest, right. <laughs> Citibank, who else? Very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. What else? Do you have any other articles you want to cover on um, on what's going on back home or globally? You know, um, there's certainly a lot more we could get to. Um, we're we're over an hour in here. Probably we'll save some of this stuff for next time. Um, certainly, some craziness going on in the Middle East between quote ISIS. <laughs> And Turkey and the United States, and claims over, and Russia obviously, uh, claims of Turkey as a uh, as a uh, proxy for the United States, um, doing business with ISIS. Um, Russia has put out all kinds of information on that. I've got a number of articles here that perhaps we'll get to in the coming weeks, um, and 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 other events. But I think we've pushed our time for today you got a few things you want to get to before we wrap up you know i there are a couple other things that i wanted to touch on related to china um but i think it's it's a little bit more than just a couple of minutes so yeah i think we'll leave it for for next week so china geopolitical show on the horizon yeah and uh more properties to come uh more information about our land project also to come so stay tuned Uh, with that, just want to thank everyone for joining us on this week's Abundant Living Ecuador podcast. Again, um, feel free to reach us at www.abequador.com or toll free at 888-999-0948. I always forget the, uh, the last four digits, so thanks for that. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and have a great week. Take care.